Philip Grand's brothers were German nationals, having been born from a German mother in Germany. While they had both lived in the United States since they were four and five, respectively, neither had officially obtained U.S. citizenship. On January 7, 1982, the brothers Karl Heinz Legrand and Walter Bernhard Legrand, bungled an armed bank robbery in Marana, Arizona, United States, killing a man and severely injuring a woman in the process. They were subsequently charged and convicted of murder and sentenced to death. Walter Bernhard Legrand, was the older brother of Karl Heinz Legrand. Walter was born on January 26, 1962, in Augsburg, West Germany. As youths, Walter Legrand and his brother Karl set fire to a golf course, which did $20,000 damage, while the family lived at a military post in Texas. Carl and Walter were convicted of the armed robbery of three Tucson supermarkets in a six-day period in 1981. They both were imprisoned at that point. After their release, the brothers wanted a quick fix for their money woes. Carl Legrand was born on October 20, 1963, in Augsburg, West Germany. Carl Legrand first got in trouble with the law at age 9 when he stole $9.69 from a store in Sierra Vista and a pair of shoes from another store two months later. On the morning of January 7, 1982, Walter and Carl Legrand drove from Tucson, where they lived, to Marana intending to rob the bank. They brought a briefcase with a steak knife, bandanas, electrical tape, police radio scanner and toy gun inside. They arrived in Marana sometime before 8 a.m. because the bank was closed and empty the Legrands drove around Marana to pass time. They eventually drove to the El Taco restaurant adjacent to the bank. Ronald Schunk, manager of El Taco testified that he arrived at work at 7.50 a.m. The moment he arrived, a car with two men inside drove up to the El Taco. Shunk described the car as white with a chocolate-colored top. The car's driver, identified by Shunk as Walter Legrand, asked Shunk when the El Taco opened. Shunk replied, 9 o'clock. The Legrand then left. Hartsek, the bank manager, showed up a few minutes later and brought the U.S. and Arizona flags outside to be raised for the day. Carl pulled the toy gun and ordered him inside the building. A 20-year-old female teller, pulled up a few minutes later. Don Lopez arrived for work at the bank at approximately 8 a.m. when she arrived at the bank. She noticed three vehicles parked in the parking lot, a motor home. A truck belonging to the bank manager, Ken Hartsek, and a car which she did not recognize but which she described as white or off-white with a brown top. Because Lopez believed that, Hartsek might be conducting business and desire some privacy, she left the parking lot and drove around Marana for several minutes. She returned to the bank, and noticed Hartsick standing by the bank door with another man whom she did not recognize. Lopez parked her car and walked toward the bank entrance where Hartsick was standing. As she passed, the Legrand's car Walsh emerged from the car and asked her what time the bank opened. Lopez replied, 10 o'clock. Lopez continued walking and went into the bank. When she entered the bank, she saw Hartsick standing by the vault with Carl Legrand. Carl was wearing a coat and tie and carrying a briefcase. Carl told her to sit down and opened his jacket to reveal a gun, which was later found by the police to be a toy pistol. 
Walter then came through the bank entrance and stood by the vault. Lopez testified that Walter then said, if you can't open it this time, let's just waste them and leave. Hartsick was unable to open the vault because he had only one half of the vault combination. The bank employees told the Legrand brothers that they only knew half of the combination to the safe and that they would have to wait for a third bank employee to report to work before it could be opened. The Legrand then moved Lopez and Hartsick into Hartsick's office where they bound their victim's hands together with black electrical tape. The Legrands became increasingly anxious as the other employee failed to show up. Walter accused Hartsick of lying and put a letter opener to his throat, threatening to kill him if he was not telling the truth. Lopez and Hartsick then were gagged with bandanas. Wilma Rogers, another bank employee, had arrived at the bank at approximately 8. 10 a.m. upon arriving, Rogers noticed two strange vehicles in the parking lot and, fearing that something might be amiss, wrote down the license plate numbers of the two unknown vehicles. She then went to a nearby grocery store and telephoned the bank. Lopez answered the phone after her gag was removed. Her hands remained tied. Carl held the receiver to Lopez's ear and listened to the conversation. Lopez answered the phone. Rogers asked for heartsick but Lopez denied that he was there, which struck Rogers as odd because she had seen his truck in the bank parking lot. Rogers then told Lopez that her car headlights were still on, as indeed they were. Rogers told Lopez that if she did not go out to turn her headlights off, then she would call the sheriff. A few minutes later Rogers asked someone else to call the bank and they also were told that Hartsick was not there. Rogers then called the town marshal's office. After the first telephone call the Legrand decided to have Lopez turn off her headlights. Her hands were freed and she was told to go turn off the lights, but was warned that if you try to go, if you try to leave, we'll just shoot him and leave. We're just going to kill him and leave. Lopez went to her car and turned off the lights. Upon her return to the bank her hands were retied. Hartsick was still bound and gagged in the same chair. Lopez was seated in a chair, and turned toward a corner of the room. Hartsick, believing that Carl Legrand was about to attack the woman, kicked him in the shins. A savage response ensued. Lopez testified that soon thereafter she heard sounds of a struggle. Fearing that Hartsick was being hurt, Lopez stood up broke the tape around her hands and turned to help him. Lopez testified that for a few seconds she saw Hartsick struggling with two men. Carl was behind Hartsick holding him by the shoulders while Walter was in front. According to Lopez, Walter then came toward her and began stabbing her. Lopez fell to the floor where she could see only the scuffling of feet and Hartsick lying face down on the floor. She then heard someone twice say, just make sure he's dead. Hartsick's throat was slashed and he suffered 23 other knife wounds, at least 6 of which could have been fatal, investigators said. The woman also was stabbed 7 times in the head, side and shoulder but survived. The Legrands left the bank and returned to Tucson. Lopez was able to call for help. When law enforcement and medical personnel arrived at the bank Hartsick was dead. Lopez was taken to University Hospital in Tucson. Law enforcement personnel quickly identified the Legrands as suspects. 
By 3.15 p.m., police had traced the license plate number to a white and brown vehicle owned by the father of Walter's girlfriend, Karen. The apartment where the Legrands were staying with Karen was placed under surveillance. Shortly thereafter Walter, Carl and Karen left the apartment and began driving. They were followed and soon pulled over. Walter and Carl were then arrested and the car was searched. Karen's apartment was also searched and a steak knife similar to one found at the bank was seized. Carl's fingerprint was found at the bank. A briefcase containing a toy gun, black electrical tape, a red bandana, and other objects was found beneath a desert bush and turned over to the police. When questioned after their apprehension, Walter made no statements, but Carl confessed to the crimes in two different statements. He stated that he had stabbed Hartsick and Lopez, but that Walter had not stabbed anyone and that Walter had been out of the room at the time. Following a jury trial, both were convicted on all charges. After considering mitigating and aggravating circumstances, the judge sentenced both defendants to death. As foreigners, the Legrands should have been informed of their right to consular assistance, under the Vienna Convention, from their state of nationality, Germany. However the Arizona authorities failed to do this even after they became aware that the Legrands were German nationals. The Legrand brothers later contacted Consul William Behrens, head of the German consulate in Phoenix, on their own accord, having learned of their right to consular assistance. They appealed their sentences and convictions, on the grounds that they were not informed of their right to consular assistance, and that with consular assistance they might have been able to mount a better defense. The federal courts rejected their argument, on grounds of procedural default, which provides that issues cannot be raised in federal court appeals unless they have first been raised in state courts. Germany initiated legal action in the International Court of Justice against the United States regarding Walter Legrand. Hours before Walter Legrand was due to be executed, Germany applied for the court to grant a provisional court order, requiring the United States to delay the execution of Walter Legrand, which the court granted. Germany then initiated action in the U.S. Supreme Court for enforcement of the provisional order. In its judgment, the U.S. Supreme Court held that it lacked jurisdiction with respect to Germany's complaint against Arizona due to the 11th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, which prohibits federal courts from hearing lawsuits of foreign states against a U.S. state. With respect to Germany's case against the United States, it held that the doctrine of procedural default was not incompatible with the Vienna Convention, and that even if procedural default did conflict with the Vienna Convention it had been overruled by later federal law the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act of 1996, which explicitly legislated the doctrine of procedural default. Germany then modified its complaint in the case before the ICJ, alleging furthermore that the U.S. violated international law by failing to implement the provisional measures. In opposition to the German submissions, the United States argued that the Vienna Convention did not grant rights to individuals, only to states that the convention was meant to be exercised subject to the laws of each state party, which in the case of the United States meant subject to the doctrine of procedural default, and that Germany was seeking to turn the ICJ into an international court of criminal appeal. Diplomatic efforts, including pleas by German Ambassador Jürgen Krebog, and German Member of Parliament Claudia Roth, 
and the recommendation of Arizona's clemency board. Failed to sway Arizona Governor Jane Deho, who insisted that the executions be carried out. Carl Legrand was subsequently executed by the state of Arizona on February 24, 1999, by lethal injection. Carl was 35 years old at his time of execution. Walter Legrand was executed March 3, 1999, by lethal gas, and currently remains the last person executed by that method in the United States. Walter was 37 years at his time of execution. Thank you for watching Death Row.